It was December of 2019. The president was just weeks away from being impeached for the first time. It was a stressful, chaotic time for the White House. And yet, President Trump's mind was elsewhere. We have a situation where we're looking very strongly at sinks and showers and other elements of bathrooms. People are flushing toilets 10 times, 15 times, as opposed to once. They end up using more water. So EPA is looking at that very strongly, at my suggestion. Now, in this job that I am privileged to have, I have traveled all over this country, literally. I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people about the problems that they've got in their everyday lives. And not once has anyone told me that they wish the president of the United States would increase the internal velocity of their toilets or the water coming out of their sinks. But for a while, it was something Donald Trump was kind of obsessed with. I said, sinks, showers, and toilets. It's the shower, it's the sink. I won't talk about the fact that people have to flush their toilet 15 times. Okay. Dishwashers, sinks, toilets, sinks, toilets, and showers. We won't talk about toilets. Toilets, toilets, sinks. Right? Showers. And what goes with a sink and a shower? <laughs> Truly the oddest call and response of all time, making the audience scream toilets back at you. Here's the thing. I don't really care why Donald Trump was obsessed with toilets. To be perfectly honest, I don't really want to know why or where he got involved in discussions about having to flush toilets 15 times. Unfortunately, though, the former president's bizarre predilection for toilets is, in fact, in the news today. And as a serious journalist, it is my duty to tell you about it. According to the New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman, when Donald Trump was president, his staff used to periodically find wads of printed paper clogging the White House toilets. They believed President Trump was purposely attempting to flush pieces of paper down the toilet. The former president immediately poo-pooed these ideas, reporting, saying that uh, he never put presidential records in a toilet, which is definitely a thing I cannot believe that I just said on TV. But Bloomberg reporter Jennifer Jacobs confirmed the reporting with her own sources, too. She says that Trump staffers would try to fish clumped, torn and shredded papers out of the White House toilet. Who knows, maybe that's why the president was so obsessed with the firepower of the network of toilets in this country. What this reporting does make clear, though, is that Donald Trump has certainly deployed a diverse range of tactics for destroying presidential records. We've been following the reporting all week about how Donald Trump reportedly ripped up White House records during his time in office, despite being required by law to preserve all documents that have come across his desk. Staffers had to try and jigsaw them back together, taping them back together. Other documents were just destroyed entirely, put into burn bags. Didn't even know what burn bags were. They were put into burn bags for staffers to decide what to keep, what to shred, and potentially what to burn. One of the president's former aides, Omarosa Manigault Newman, told me on my show on Sunday that she once even saw Donald Trump chewing up the remains of a document he had shredded in the Oval Office. He literally put the paper in his mouth to destroy it. A germaphobe, by the way, didn't put much in his mouth. Just today, the New York Times reported that the January 6th investigation in Congress has found gaps in the official White House telephone logs on the day of the Capitol attack. This week, the Washington Post has reported that he also improperly took 15 boxes of materials to Mar-a-Lago, which had to be later retrieved by the National Archives. And tonight, the Washington Post is out with a huge scoop about what exactly was in those 15 boxes. Here's the lead. Quote, some of the White House documents that Donald Trump improperly took to his Mar-a-Lago residence were clearly marked as classified, including documents at the top secret level, according to two people familiar with the matter. While it was unclear how many classified documents were among those received by the National Archives and Records Administration, some bore markings that the information was extremely sensitive and would be limited to a small group of officials with authority to view such highly classified information, end quote. The handling of sensitive classified information is a highly regulated thing. Mishandling that kind of material 
is against the law. Which leads me to the other piece of explosive reporting in the Post tonight, that the National Archives has now asked the Justice Department to look into this matter, to see if anyone should be potentially prosecuted for stowing top secret documents at the former president's beach resort. Gelatin. Gelatin. Gelatin is the jiggly wiggly stuff that makes your jello and your gummy candy. Goes in a whole lot of other foods and pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. It's in a lot of stuff. It's big business, and most of it is made from animal products. So about 15 years ago, a guy from Wisconsin went down to Mississippi with a plan to make gelatin out of catfish waste, all the stuff that's left over from catfish processing, the stuff that would just typically be thrown away. This guy and his business partner brought in all these potential investors and told them this business plan was a sure bet. There was nothing they didn't know about making gelatin out of catfish waste. The gelatin was perfected and ready to be sold. They already had a $3 million contract set up with a buyer for it. Sounded great. Investors handed over hundreds of thousands of dollars to the project. The state of Mississippi also gave them hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants. They also got a loan from a bank. And for a while, seemed, uh, things seemed to be going well, at least as far as the investors knew. The guy running the gelatin from Catfish Waste Company was sending them emails and letters telling them how well things were going, telling them the company, quote, is producing product, shipping, and invoicing customers. We have contracted orders from two large customers totaling 3,000 metric tons per year. We've completely sold out of gelatin at a good price, end quote. The U.S. Navy's interested in our amazing catfish waste into gelatin process. Oh, and hey, by the way, we've just signed a contract for over a million dollars with a new processor, plus we're going to get 50% of the profits from that new second processing plant. But we're just a little short on liquid cash to get over the hump till that second plant is open, so... If y'all could chip in $25,000 more a piece, or more if you're feeling generous, that would be great. And so the investors kicked in more cash. But guess what? And I bet you can probably guess where this is going. Yeah, there was no new processor or second plant. There were no million dollar contracts. In fact, there was barely even any gelatin. There was a whole lot of catfish waste. From court documents, they were, quote, never able to manufacture a sellable product, often pouring the results of their attempts in a ditch behind the plant. In fact, they were only able to make viable batches of the product a couple of times. As a result, the company had no customers and never made any sales, end quote. An investor testified that he asked the guy running the company why he did not tell the investors the truth in these letters he was sending out, to which the guy replied, quote, they can't handle the truth. Now, I said these were court documents because ultimately federal prosecutors brought multiple felony charges against this guy and his catfish waste to gelatin scheme that bilked investors and a bank out of their money. He always maintained his innocence, but ultimately he was convicted on mail fraud and bank fraud charges, ordered to pay about $2 million, and sentenced to 70 months in prison. He was released in 2014. But recently he's been peddling a new project. This was the headline in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel last summer. A Wisconsin man is scanning ballots and suing a county clerk as he launches his own election review. The story that follows is as nutty as the headline sounds. To be clear, there is also an investigation launched by Wisconsin Republicans into the 2020 election, run by a guy who says the election was stolen and who's hired Trump administration officials as his investigators. That investigation is ongoing to the tune of at least many hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars. But this is not that. This was just a random guy tooling around making copies of ballots because he decided to run his own private freelance election investigation. And once the local press cottoned on to what he was doing, it didn't take long for them to realize that the guy wandering the state copying ballots for his own freelance investigation was, in fact, our friend who went to prison for his catfish waste into gelatin scam. And look, this guy has served his time. 
He's paid his debt to society, even if, as of 2020, he apparently hadn't paid back much of the nearly $2 million that he also owes in restitution. And I suppose if he wants to travel the state of Wisconsin making copies of ballots, it's a free country. And apparently uh, that is something you are free to do in Wisconsin. Help yourself. But by this December, things had kind of escalated. In a December lawsuit, he accused the director of elections in Milwaukee of being part of a, quote, sect that planned, conspired and implemented a massive election fraud by using fake names and fake addresses to cast ballots. He claimed that this sect allowed somebody to print ballots for Biden in a back conference room. His filing included a hand-drawn floor plan of an election office with a spot labeled, quote, hidden room. Someone was sleeping, snoring. And now that guy, the catfish waste into gelatin scam, make copies of all the ballots. There's a secret sect in a hidden room printing ballots for Biden guy. That guy, well, he was invited by Republicans to give a presentation to the state's Assembly Elections Committee. Someone is using, we don't know who, someone is using our systems, our databases, to cast illegal ballots. We have found tens of thousands. We don't know who's doing it. It's probably not the person who's the name. It's probably uh, some bad guy. Something's wrong. Somebody's in there. Somebody's doing something wrong, casting illegal ballots. Somebody's in there. They're adding names. They're adding fake voters. They're casting illegal ballots by the tens of thousands. So I appreciate your time, and thank you for having me here today. They're adding fake voters. They're casting illegal ballots by the tens of thousands. We don't know who's doing it, but it's bad guys. Bad guys are doing it. And he should know he's got thousands of volunteers and a supercomputer working on this stuff. This is what Republicans on the Elections Committee are doing in Wisconsin right now. now I will say there are a couple of Democrats on that committee. They tried, tried valiantly to pin this guy down on something. He was a bit like gelatin. It was tough going. You did say that um, there were people who who told you or told your group that they had showed up to vote at the polls and were told that someone had already voted in their name. Uh, do you have, either for us or, or for law enforcement, affidavits from those people uh, detailing those what, issues? What we do is we encourage those people, uh, many of them are afraid to come forward, but we have found hundreds and hundreds of them. None of them would sign an affidavit? I would say none, but, uh, I mean, we don't uh, say if we have 500, uh, maybe a dozen. I'd take five. Yeah, um, no, I, I don't have them. No, okay. I don't. The poor state assemblyman. Do you have any evidence? Maybe five people? Maybe one person? Nope, sorry, you're just going to have to take my word for it. We also reached out to this gentleman this evening to ask if he could provide us with any evidence. He didn't respond to our request for comment. I am now officially out of my depth. So joining me is Dan Goldman. He is the former assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. He served as the House Majority Counsel during Donald Trump's first impeachment trial. Uh, Daniel, I'm OK with the, the, the plunger and the toilet side of this equation. I don't understand the rest of it. So please help us out here. Certainly, Ali, from my experience on the House Intelligence Committee, where uh, everyone needed to have top secret clearance, uh, there are very, very carefully choreographed methods to protect classified information. Um, classified information, particularly top secret information, does not leave a secured um, classified area. Uh, if it does, you put it in a bag with a lock on it. Um, there are really, really detailed and careful procedures to make sure that no classified material uh, is ever left out to the public for anyone without uh, top secret or secret or whatever classification clearance that is necessary. And it doesn't really matter uh, on one level as to who was ultimately responsible for bringing those boxes down to Mar-a-Lago, because almost certainly whatever was in those boxes should not have been classified information. Now, the president himself does have the right and the authority to declassify documents. 
But he doesn't just wave a wand in the air and say, oh, that's what I'm going to do. This document is declassified. That document is declassified. All of these documents have very clear markings on them. They'll say uh, secret, top secret, and a variety of other um, uh, markings. And one of those markings would be declassified or it would cross over the classification markings from earlier if it were to be declassified. So there's a process. And the fact of there being top secret documents in random boxes in Mar-a-Lago is in and of itself mishandling of classified information. What we don't know is who did that, who was responsible for it. Sir, presumably Donald Trump was not packing his own boxes, but was he aware of what was in them? And who else was aware, who oversaw this? And that's where the Department of Justice and the FBI need to get involved, because even if there's no criminal investigation or criminal prosecution that arises from this, it is a national security issue. And the FBI's counterintelligence division needs to figure out what happened. Does this fall under the purview of the January 6th investigation or is this an FBI Justice Department matter? No, and there was in the report, it also says that even when they uncovered the top secret information and relayed that to the FBI, the FBI was still figuring out what they should do with it. But I do think it's important to put this in perspective, okay? The classification issues, the um, uh, related to the stuff that was in the documents, the Presidential Records Act violation is not something that really falls within the purview of the January 6th committee. The House Oversight Committee under Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney has announced an investigation into that issue. That is separate from the January 6th investigation. What, what I think is important and that overlaps a lot with this Presidential Records Act and the January 6th committee investigation is two things. One, one is the fact that there are very few call logs from the day of January 6th is an issue. What happened? Was Donald Trump uh, intentionally concealing conversations that he was having with people through his aides' personal cell phones that are not protected uh, and are not supposed to be used? Uh, or or where where was he when he was making these having these conversations? Because we know that he also was sneaking people in the side door for meetings prior to January 6th. And then the other thing that I think is very important here and is a continuation of a pattern that we've seen from Donald Trump is the destruction of these documents, whether he ripped them up, tore them up, ate them, flushed them down the toilet or whatever it is. He is destroying presidential records now. That's a violation of the Presidential Records Act. But this is also someone who obstructed the Mueller investigation, who obstructed the uh, first impeachment investigation that I worked on, and has a history of obstructing investigations, of trying to hide what we can only assume now is misconduct because of the pattern and practice of doing that. And so the question then becomes, what is he ripping up? What is he tearing? Mm -hmm. What is he trying to hide? And presumably that falls under the January 6th investigation. This is the graceful. She is a $100 million super yacht, the length of three basketball courts. According to the website Boat International, she has an indoor pool that can be converted into a dance hall, a drop down screen and projector for private ocean movie screenings, a helideck to land your helicopter, a gym, a cocktail bar, and a spa pool alongside another two plunge pools for either hot or cold dips. Back in September, the Graceful docked at a German shipyard for some upgrades. She was there to be re uh, retrofitted with two brand new balconies and an extended swimming platform. But then suddenly this week, German media reported that the Graceful was departing that shipyard unexpectedly before workers could finish their upgrades. And this is important because the Russian owner of the Graceful is believed to be none other than the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Putin's luxury party boat was relocated from German waters into Russian territory, leading some to believe that the Russian president is trying to get the boat out of NATO-controlled seas so that it cannot be seized as part of any U.S. and European sanctions following a Russian incursion into Ukraine. Now, 
We do not know for sure if this is Vladimir Putin's boat and whether he decided to move his big nautical nightclub. But as Rachel would say, watch this space or watch that boat.